Charlie? Yep. yep. Okay, excellent. Great. So uh, welcome to the first session. Uh, thanks all for making it in somewhat unusual circumstances, but I'm super psyched that it's going to be quite fun. Uh, uh, thanks everyone for you know recording your videos. Uh, I, I watched the videos. They're going to be really interesting talks. So in this session, we have some very interesting talks on distributed and parallel computation. So the first two talks are going to give us some really new insights uh, on very basic questions in distributed and asynchronous computation, like contention resolution and leader election. And the last two talks would be about you know parallel algorithms for some modular minimization and maximization. Again, basic problems. So I'm sure all the attendees are going to have uh, you know uh, a pretty fun time in the next uh, 40 minutes or so. So let's start with our first speaker, uh, Bill. Uh, whenever you're ready, uh, you can start uh, sharing your screen. So Bill will tell us about uh, you know a new contention resolution protocol that works without collision detection. Bill, take it away. Bill, you're muted. Sorry about that. Thanks. No worries. Excellent. Okay. So. Uh, I'm Bill Kuzma. This is joint work with Michael Bender, Tsvi Kapelowitz, and Seth Petty. And the goal of this five minute talk is really just to explain what the title of this paper means and what our main result is. Uh, to start off with, let me just explain what the setting in which our problem takes place is. It takes place on what's known as a shared channel. And in a shared channel, on each step, the players that are present on the channel can each try to broadcast on the channel if they want. The catch is that if more than one player tries to broadcast on the same step, then the attempts collide and nobody succeeds. On the other hand, if exactly one player tries to broadcast on a given step, that's how you get a successful broadcast. In this example, we have two successful broadcasts. This idea of a shared channel goes back to the late 1970s with the introduction of the Aloha Network Protocol, but it also captures problems such as, for example, uh, Ethernet connections, where you've got players interacting over a shared cable. The other thing that you need to know about shared ch channels is that players get a certain form of feedback known as binary feedback. That means that at the end of each step, each player receives a one if there was a successful broadcast that occurred during that step, and a zero if no successful broadcast occurred. The players can then use that feedback in order to adopt their future in future their behavior in future steps. Okay, so that's a shared channel. And then the problem that we're going to be talking about is actually a very natural, simple problem known as contention resolution. The overall structure is that you've got players arriving onto a shared channel over time, and each player has one message that they want to successfully broadcast on that channel. The goal is then for the players to somehow work together in order to make good utilization of the channel. That is, they want to get what's known as good implicit throughput. Now, let me define this problem in a little more detail. And to do that, it's helpful from, to see it from the perspective of a given player. So the player arrives at some point in time. And from the player's perspective, that's just time zero. The player then stays on the channel until finally the player successfully broadcasts their message. And when that happens, that's when the player leaves the system. That marks the end of the player's lifetime. That's a given player's perspective. But then the goal is for the players to work together in order to achieve what's known as constant implicit throughput. Now, the definition of implicit throughput is a little bit weird. The way it works is that at any given moment, the implicit throughput so far is just the total number of players that have arrived into the system so far divided by the total number of steps during which at least one player was present. In particular, the important thing here is that the steps during which no players were present, those steps don't count against your algorithm. The goal is to make it so that the number of steps during which players are present is just proportional to the number of players that arrive into the system. That's constant implicit throughput. Okay, so then, the main result of this paper is that you actually can achieve constant implicit throughput in the contention resolution problem, at least with high probability in the number of players that arrive. That's our main result. Okay, the last thing that I need to explain in order to really put some context into this result is what was the state of the art before this result? 
the state of the art used an extra form of feedback known as collision detection. This means that at each step, players are given not just binary feedback, but they're also told if at that step there was a collision between broadcast attempts that caused a failure. This means players can distinguish between failures due to collisions versus failures due to nobody attempting to broadcast. And of course, this suggests a very natural approach for players to follow, which is that at each step, if you see a collision, you should decrease your probability of broadcasting in future steps. And if you see a step where nobody broadcasted, you should increase your probability of broadcasting in future steps. It turns out that actually, if you do this in just the right way, you actually can solve contention resolution with constant implicit throughput. And so that ends up being the state of the art and that was a very elegant result in SOSA 2019. Okay, so now we can finally put the pieces together. So this paper, the title of this paper is Contention Resolution Without Collision Detection. And what that means is we solve the contention resolution problem on shared channels, meaning we achieve constant implicit throughput with high probability. And what distinguishes this paper from the previous state of the art is that it's the first paper to do this without the use of collision detection. And that's, 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 the, that's my five minute spiel. That, yeah, that was an excellent spiel, uh, Bill. Uh, let's see if there are questions. Great, so uh, we have a question from Z who's asking, is there any upper bound on the best possible throughput? How big is the gap between the upper and lower bounds? That's a great question. So in general, um, because only one player can succeed on a given step, the number of steps during which you need to have players in the system is at least the number of players that arrive into the system. So that means you can't in general do better than constant implicit throughput, where remember, higher implicit throughput would be better and lower would be worse. And so in the worst case, you're forced to have at, at best constant implicit throughput and our result shows that you can get constant implicit throughput. And then exactly what's the best constant, that's not known. And that's actually a, a pretty interesting open question. Actually, just a quick follow up on the same question is the constant that comes out in your result uh, at all clear or, or it's like kind of hidden? Um, so in, in our result, the constant is, is not totally clear what that constant is. And it's actually one direction that we're thinking about right now is how do you get, mm -hmm. you know, how do you really optimize the constants for this kind of problem? Because in practice that ends up being important. Right, yeah, that's, uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Thanks for answering, Bill. So the next question I have for you uh, is by Joseph Downs, and he asks, without collision detection, how do the players know when they are done? Ah, so the players still receive binary feedback, which means that the players still know at each step whether there was a successful broadcast or not. In particular, if you attempted to broadcast on a step and you find out that there was a successful broadcast on that step, you can conclude that you must have been the successful broadcast. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way that players can know when it's time to leave the system. All right, so uh, those seem to be the questions from the attendees. I guess I have one quick question since we seem to have 30 more seconds. Um, is there any, what's maybe a reasonable model where one could actually hope to prove a lower bound uh, uh, for this problem? Well, so there's a whole bunch of interesting settings that you can, where you can try to kind of add some extra spice to the problem. Mm -hmm. So one that we consider in the paper is what happens if you allow an adversary to jam a constant fraction of steps. That means that those mm -hmm. steps fail no matter what, even if mm -hmm. exactly one player broadcasts on them. Mm -hmm. And in that setting, you actually can prove a lower bound that distinguishes between the setting where you have collision detection versus not. So in the setting with collision detection, it was known that you could still get constant throughput even with mm -hmm. jamming. And actually, without collision detection, we show a lower bound saying it's impossible. That's excellent. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Bill. Uh, so since there are no other questions, I think we should all thank Bill for the excellent talk and taking all of our questions. Oh, actually, there's one quick question, and I think I do have one minute, so I'll go ahead with it. 
So non Mr. Tendi who asks for this algorithm, it seems that the stragglers can still stick around for multiple rounds. Is there any upper bound on the time in the system for each element rather than the overall throughput? So perhaps let's say, for example, the max amount of time that let's say a player waits. That's a great question. So we don't have a bound on kind of, that's kind of like, is there, it's kind of, you know, this, we're studying throughput and there's kind of the analogous question of latency, right? What's the, what's the most highest latency for any player between when they enter versus when they succeed? And our algorithm doesn't, as far as I know, emit a good bound on latency, although you might be able to, um, that's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer to it. Okay, and I, I missed it, but there's also a raised hand. So let me maybe uh, let Vijaya ask uh, the question. See, how do I do that? Go ahead, Vijaya. Sorry, we just figured out how to <laughs> unmute you. Unmute. Oh, okay. No, I just had a question about, uh, I, I enjoyed your talk, William, uh, uh, that you recorded, but I was just curious, I know that we're past the time, about the tools that you use to um, establish your result. I know that you came up with this new mechanism of going between phases. Uh, did, are your uh, proofs the analysis uh, similar to what was done earlier, or was there a new component there that you would like to highlight? Well, there's there's kind of two things that show up in this proof that um, that that ended up being kind of unique to this algorithm. So one was there was there was a lot of cases where you had to do an amortization argument where you charge steps either to the arrival of players or to the departure of players. Um, but then the other thing was that. Um, because of the way in which randomization ends up playing such a big role in this algorithm, a bigger role than it has kind of tended to play. Well, I mean, you know, in, in, in some of the past algorithms, randomization played yeah. a very large role, but right. kind of a different one. And so there ended up being a lot of sort of balls and bin style analyses working together concurrently in our analysis in order to prove that everything worked out. And that ended up being, uh, well, at least one of the funnest parts of the analysis. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you for taking uh, you know long uh, long time of questions and answering them very well. Uh, let's move on with our next speaker and thank Bill. So our next speaker is Peter Peter Pl Peter Kling, who is going to uh, you know tell us about optimal time and space leader election protocols. Um, so uh, whenever you're ready, uh, Peter, please share your screen and take it away. Okay, can you see it? Uh, yes. All right. Okay, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Welcome everybody to my talk. Um, so um, what I present today is a joint work with Petra Berenting and George Giacopes. And I guess more or less everybody knows or has an idea about what leader election is, but maybe that's not true for population protocols. So let me give you a, a pretty quick introduction. So it's a model for distributed computing. And what you do here is you consider a system consisting of n identical agents. And um, your goal is to reach a global configuration where exactly one of these agents is in a distinguished state in such a leader state. And then this should be maintained uh, no matter what happens in the future. Yeah? And uh, to achieve this, population protocols consider discrete rounds. And during each such discrete round, a pair of the nodes is selected. And uh, these nodes interact with each other. And this interaction, they just observe each other's state. Yeah? So you should imagine the agents as simple state uh, machines. And uh, when they have observed each other's state, they can update their own state. So as a very simple example, let's look, take a look at one of the easiest uh, leader election protocols. It consists of just two states. So we have an uh, orange leader state here and a blue minion state. And everybody initially thinks of himself being a leader. And then we have only one update rule, which just states whenever two leaders interact with each other, one of them is knocked out. Yeah, so we, inter we select two random leaders or two random nodes, they're leaders, they interact, so one of them is knocked out. 
And you can imagine if you repeat this, then obviously at the end, you will end up in such a leader configuration, which we seek. Right? Unfortunately, it takes quite some time. So what people have been looking at is how long does it take and how many states do you need? Yeah? So uh, this is roughly what we know about it. So let's first look at the negative side. Um, here are some lower bounds. And so for example, one of the lower bounds we know says something like, um, if you have roughly log log n uh, states available, so at most log log n, let's say log log n over two actually, um, then the number of interactions you need in expectation to elect a leader will be roughly n square. Yeah? So you cannot do better. Um, there's also an unconditional uh, lower bound, which says like, no, how, no matter how many states I give you, uh, you cannot do better in expectation than n log n interactions. Uh, it's a very natural uh, lower bound for such a sequential distributed system uh, because we have sequential interactions. Now, on the upper, uh, on the, on the upper uh, bound side, we have quite a few algorithms uh, over the time which tried to get close to these lower bounds. And the previously best one uh, was already pretty close. So uh, this is this uh, green one here, which achieved uh, basically an optimal uh, number of states asymptotically. So they have, have roughly log log n states. And they were only uh, log log n factor away from these n log n interactions. And uh, our contribution or main contribution uh, is basically to close this gap. Yeah, so we show that you can actually come up with a leader election protocol in this model, which uh, achieves optimal time and optimal space uh, simultaneously. Okay. And um, yeah, so in the remaining time, I won't have enough time to go into the details because it's a, so this basically shows you a rough overview of our protocol. And it consists of a lot of sub protocols, which kind of delicately go into each other and interact with each other. But let me give you like one example uh, of a property which is kind of new to our protocol. So um, here in this diagram you see time and uh, here on the upper half you, we, I marked the size of some sets of uh, certain nodes which we try to create during the construction. And something which you typically do in such leader election protocols, you often start with a, a set of a certain size, or you try to come up with a set of size at least one and at most n to the one minus epsilon. And then you gradually try to uh, reduce the size of the set until you have a single leader. And we start with something very similar. So we start with such a set and then reduce it to size at most square root n. And uh, then it turns out um, for, like there are different ways how to proceed now. But the problem here is that um, you're not really sure how many nodes are within the set, right? There can be anything between one and square root n. And uh, in simple idea, what you could try to do is when do something whenever two, uh, two agents of the set interact with each other yeah? uh, and then come up with some, some protocol based on it. The problem is that if there are much fewer nodes in here, like n to the one fourth, then such interactions are extremely unlikely. And to enable uh, protocols based on such interactions, what we do is we start to increase this, this set of at most square root n log n inter, uh, leader candidates to size pretty exactly n to the three fourth. So instead of going down all the time, we actually go up in a controlled way, uh, which uh, allows you to give upper and lower bounds on this. And then the, like, uh, this, this happens in this dual epidemic selection process here. And then the rest here, so this, this part kind of simply says, says something, okay, if two of these yellow guys meet, of these n to the three fourth nodes, they will create a kind of a new leader candidate set. And you can easily show that this new set will have size pretty exactly n square, uh, uh, square root n. And when you do this, like this exact thing again, the exact same thing again, so two of these square root n many guys create a new kind of orange leader candidate. This would be these. Uh, you can show, okay, this will happen with probability one over n. So within these n log n time steps, this will actually happen not too often. So you get uh, out here with a pretty uh, low number of uh, expected leaders. And it turns out once you're here, kind of like if you're careful, uh, you can use known uh, ideas to reduce it further down to a single leader. 
but you just have to be a little bit careful in the end game, basically. All right, I think that's everything I can explain you to you in this short amount of time, so but feel free to ask any question. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Peter. Uh, yeah, we have about uh, two, two and a half minutes for questions. Are there, okay, there we are. So uh, we have our first question, uh, which asks the following, from the first example that you show, there seems to be an underlying assumption that the interactions are asymmetric. Uh, that is that there is a symmetry breaking between two interacting nodes with the same state. Is this necessary? Um, for this protocol we use, it is, yeah. So in, you, you, you basically, um, you, a lot of these protocols basically can, or in a lot of cases you can use this kind of asynchronity to simulate, for example, something like randomness or things like that, or uh, some random input. Um, but uh, you, there are ways to get around that. Okay, that uh, helps. I guess I had maybe one more meta-like or somewhat general question. It's like it seems your com you know your protocol has lots of bells and whistles and it's kind of complicated. Do you foresee like a simple protocol achieving the optimal performance, or do we have to live with it? Uh, I don't know, personally, so I think that probably there are ways to reduce it. So it's not clear whether you really, so I mean, kind of our protocol requires this part where we go up to the end to the three, four uh, nodes here, where we increase the set. It's, it would be interesting to know whether this is actually really necessary or whether you can come up with kind of a monotonous, monotonous protocol. It's not clear mm -hmm. to me. Um, I kind of think, I don't know, a, a very simple protocol, I don't see it in this model because kind of at least this mm -hmm. type of runtime notion we have here uh, typically results in, uh, if, if you look at all the efficient protocols in this runtime model, they uh, become kind of ugly at some point if you really go into the details um, of, of them. I see, so life's hard. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, one more question for you from Salil Vadhan, and he asks, is there any way to tolerate some adversarial behavior uh, in this model? Mm, I guess it depends a lot on you, how you define your time notion then, because um, uh, these, like, an important part of this, this result here is that we try to stabilize, which is a very strict requirement, so we cannot, allow any error with any small probability. Mm -hmm. And basically, um, like, uh, if, if, I, if, if you're in, a, in, a, in an adversarial setting where you allow the adversary to, uh, to flip one single node and he flips the leader, uh, then you basically uh, uh, killed your, your stable configuration. So you have to be very careful how you define the adversarial model. Um, yeah, so um, I guess it depends a little, a little bit what powers you really give him. There are a few models who do that, but they typically look at other times or, or other runtime notions. Okay, uh, let's thank uh, Peter for an excellent talk and you know an excellent series of answers for all the questions that came up. So uh, for the next talk. Uh, uh, so let's, let's maybe proceed with Paul, um, uh, who will tell us about a polynomial load bound on adaptive submodular maximization, uh, you know, uh, 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 it's a really cool result. And Paul, whenever you're ready, uh, please, uh, you know, share your screen and take it okay. away. Thanks. Yeah, I was really hoping that uh, either Eric or Yaren would present before me because then they could give me give all the background and then I wouldn't have to present all these extra slides that I have. <laughs> but anyway, uh, can you guys see the slides? Okay, perfect. So uh, I'd like to tell, tell you about a polynomial lower bound on the adaptive complexity of submodular optimization. It's a mouthful, I know. We're gonna work on a better title. If you have one, please suggest it. <laughs> But the basic problem, the background is uh, we're given a submodular function, which you can just imagine uh, in your head is the maximum coverage, maximum coverage problem. 
you're given a bunch of geometric areas and then say n of them and you want to find k of them such that uh, the union of their areas is maximized. So that's the example of a monotone submodular function. And uh, of course there's a classic greedy problem to solve this which is to pick the areas one by one and in each additional area you pick is sort of greedily maximizing the gain you get on top of a uh, previous area. And the problem with this is that there's a long chain of k sequentially dependent queries, which means like the next area, you sort of have to look at everything you picked before and then pick that based on this. And it's sort of a very um, undesirable if you want parallel algorithms. So uh, one question asked by Eric who was supposed to talk before me is uh, whether you can do it better if you have a parallel regime where instead of sort of doing things one by one, you could have the algorithm make many parallel queries at the same time and see how long you can get this uh, long dependent chain to be. And what they showed in 2018 is that you can actually only use log in over epsilon squared rounds of queries and still get a one minus one over E minus epsilon approximation. Uh, and they also show that, you know, log rounds is basically the best you can do because even if you want a constant approximation, you need log in over log log in. So what we show in our work, we wondered if you actually need to blow up the number of rounds as you approach one minus one over E. So even in the offline model, one minus one over E is a hardness barrier. And what we showed is if you want to get to one minus one over E minus epsilon, you need one over epsilon rounds in this parallel query model. Okay, so the main ideas behind our work is uh, this onion layer construction that appeared in Eric's 2018 paper and the symmetry gap construction technique uh, from Yan's 2007-2009 paper. And then for technical reasons, we also have an improved hardness result for one minus one over E. So let me tell you a little bit about that. Uh, so we constructed a monotone submodular function f that sort of looks like you can imagine the layers of an onion. And now when an algorithm sees this function, the best it can sort of do is peel off the layers one by one. And what I mean by that is each layer sort of contains uh, some elements of the ground set. And then when the algorithm makes a round of queries um, on the zeroth round, all the layers sort of look the same. And then the best an algorithm can do is sort of use one round of queries to figure out the outermost layer on the zeroth round. And then once that outermost layer is uh, determined, then it can start working on the second layer and the third layer and so on. And then once it produced, goes to the innermost core of the onion, uh, there's a one minus one over E hardness instance there. So it cannot do any better than that. Okay, so in the second part of the paper, we also wonder, you know, whether these hardness results can, own, can apply to the non-monotone maximization case. Uh, in the non-monotone maximization case, we're considering a submodular non-monotone function, but now it's instead unconstrained. So one example you can keep in your head is, for example, maximum cut. And in this setting, it's a little bit different. Um, it's actually known that if you can take any random set and get about a quarter of the optimal in expectation. And the hardness barrier here is uh, one half. You can't do better than one half times opt in general. So we wondered, you know, for the monotone case, the hardness result looks like something like you start out below one minus one over E, a constant below. And then no matter how many rounds of queries you do, you can't get above one minus one over E plus little o one. But actually in the non-monotone case, this sort of thing uh, doesn't apply. So what we show is uh, the classic double greedy algorithm uh, there's an adaptive version for this parallel setting. The classic double greedy algorithm 
Uh, you either have a random set that's already very close to one half times the optimal, or it finds a solution much better than one half. So to be precise, if the random set is about one half minus delta times the optimal, then you can get about one half plus delta squared in one over delta squared rounds of parallel versions. Okay, uh, that's it. So I would love to take any questions. Yeah, uh, thanks, Paul. That was a great talk, and you managed to do it exactly in time. <laughs> um, let's see, are there any questions? Yes. So let me proceed with the first question. Z Huang asks, what's your guess on the correct dependence on epsilon, linear or quadratic? I assume it is about the lower bound. Uh, yes. So you'll notice there's a little caveat here. There's a linear dependence on epsilon here for large enough epsilon, it has to be larger than one over log n. And we actually have another lower bound that says if epsilon is about inverse polynomial in n, then you need a one over epsilon, epsilon to the one third rounds. And that's for technical reasons, because when we're applying the turn off bounds, we need like at least this many elements in the set. So I, I actually believe, you know, it should be uh, linear on epsilon and this like one over epsilon to the one third thing that appears in the full paper is just a technicality. Right. Uh, I, I guess I had maybe one more question in the same vein. I guess the first one is maybe slightly meta question. So um, uh, if I restrict my submodular functions to maybe somewhat simpler classes, let's say coverage functions, uh, um, do we have much better algorithms, even in this, uh, uh, you know, model where we are trying to uh, measure the amount of adaptivity needed? Yeah, I don't believe anybody's looked at that yet. Mm -hmm. I think in general, uh, they just, the best for coverage or general uh, monotone submodular functions is this one over epsilon squared log n. Uh, and then I see there's another question do you think these lower bounds also hold for rounds of MapReduce algorithms? Yes. So we actually considered, or we actually started this project by trying to come up with a lower bound for MapReduce algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we saw that this model was more amenable to lower bounds. So I, I don't know, but I hope so. I hope these techniques could work. Mm. Uh, also just one comment or slash question so that I understood the result correctly. So the lower bound, uh, uh, when compared to the lower bound that was already known from Balkansky Singer, is interesting maybe uh, uh, at exactly like epsilon around log log n over log n, is that correct? Because below that, I suppose their lower bound applies? Uh, let's see. Uh, for small epsilon, okay, so you're saying for small epsilon is gonna take this many rounds anyway. Right. Even for like one over log n approximation. So which, you know, seems like somewhat far from one minus one over e minus epsilon, I guess. Mm. Yeah, I suppose. Although it depends, I guess, on the constant there. But uh, yeah, I suppose you could look at it that way. It could uh -huh. be, it's like a fine tuned, fine -tuned version. I Although see. the techniques we use are not the same at all. Okay, yeah, that really helps. Um, excellent. So I, I guess we have no more uh, questions for Paul, but let's see, do we have uh, Yaron or Eric here by any chance? Thanks. Okay, so uh, so what we could do for the next, uh, so you know, we have uh, we have we have some more time, thanks to Eric <laughs> and Yaron. So uh, what we can do is, you know, basically take any more questions that might be there for all of our, uh, you know, speakers. Uh, they're all here and ready for any questions. So if anybody in the attendees have any questions for any of the talks in the session, feel free to ask them right now.
So I guess I'll, I'll ask one, one more question. This seems like I can use the five minutes to my own benefit. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, I guess my question is similar to what I asked, but just maybe a little bit farther than before. So the question, the, the construction that you have, you know, this onion layer construction of hard submodular functions, uh, I guess I'm trying to understand uh, uh, what, if at all, is a restriction that could kill such pathological examples and, you know, make algorithms possible. Um, so I'm trying to understand, you know, there are a bunch of lower bounds and they're extremely fine grained and what would an algorithmist have to do to escape these? Well, all these lower bounds, they sort of depend on the fact that whatever set that the algorithm chooses to query, um, you can always manipulate your ground, your function so that it looks like a random set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if somehow an algorithm could manage to query sets that, hmm, it would have to be a restriction on the type of function so you can't create some arbitrary function that makes yeah. whatever query looks random, basically. Absolutely, yeah. So for example, would coverage functions already do it? Would they be, for example, less complicated enough that uh, such lower bounds won't apply to them? Would that be your guess? No, I think you can also make coverage functions look very random because the normal yes. lower bounds that apply in the offline model are also coverage functions. Oh, I see. But yeah, this is also like my work, Eric's work from 2018 and the paper that Eric was going to present today, they all rely mm -hmm. on this fact that, uh, oh, there's another question, but they all rely on the fact that whatever function that your algorithm actually chooses to query, they actually don't have any choice because you can make it random. Um, okay, so we, yeah, we have a, yeah, uh, so what I is, guess uh, is uh, actually known about submodular maximization in MapReduce. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, there's quite a few algorithms that gets, uh, so in MapReduce, complexity is measured by the number of rounds also, uh, but instead of parallel queries, the MapReduce algorithms are actually allowed to do that plus more. They have some local memory, uh, local memory, so they can do long changes, long chains of sequentially adaptive queries in their local memory. And for MapReduce, uh, the number of rounds required for submodular optimization is one over epsilon, one over epsilon, I think, for submodular monotone cardinality or matroid constraints but there are no lower bounds as far as we know. All right. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank Paul and in fact all our speakers again for excellent talks and taking all our long questions. Is there a way I could clap for you? Well, I'll just do this. Okay, thanks all for joining. I guess that's our session. Hope you had fun. Charlie, you can stop recording now. <laughs>